I'd like to do a real quick video here to warn you about City Boy Preppers and the fact that they will get you killed if you listen to them. Uh, it always cracks me up. I see these guys and they're from the city and whatever and they, they'll do videos on uh, how to prepare for hard times, you know, and they have this advice and things. And it's always the same advice. They're just looking at videos or a website or maybe even a little survival booklet and tells them how to survive, you know, and all this stuff. And, uh, and you know, it just, I have to smile. I mean, they mean well. I appreciate it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be pro prideful or whatever else, but uh, I've lived in the woods all my life. Um, this is my property here that I'm walking around. This is not some park that I went to. Um, this is my property. It's a very big property here in northern Maine. I own it outright. Bought it with cash. Uh, the whole thing there. Ironically, for a little over $300 an acre. So, got a really good deal on it. But uh, I've been here. I've logged this property and, and uh, thinned out some of the timber stand and whatever else. It's just what I've done. So, um, I'm not some little guy that lives in the city someplace and, you know, has just looked into survival because I think it's a neat subject. Uh, no, this has been a lifelong thing for me. I've experienced off-grid locations in Pennsylvania where I grew up, here in Maine, uh, Alaska, Montana, and even down in the jungles of Costa Rica, believe it or not. So I've been around and I've studied a lot down through the years and not just reading I've put what I've uh, seen and and well, I do read but um, I've seen it and I put it into practice all right I'll show you up here most of these are balsam fir trees the green ones there that you're seeing but I'll show you this place was this property was logged very hard in 2014 so 10 years away from the logging that they did but um, here you can see some of these real small little quaking aspen trees here. And uh, over here on this side of the trail, um, I've thinned a lot of these out. They were real close to each other, maybe a foot or two apart. So, and uh, when you thin them out like that, they just explode in growth. They get really big. Um, as you can see, the ones over here on this side of the trail, you can see I can fit my hand around it like that. If you can see that. This one, this side of the trail, I thinned about a year after this other side over here, which I'll show you, over here. And look at this tree. I can't get my fingers, I can't touch my fingers on that one. You can see how much bigger this one is. That's called good forestry practice. Yes, it's uh, important to cut trees down on your property. You just have to know what you're doing. And um, if you can look, I'll show you one other thing here quick. If you look over this way, Back in, back in there, you can see a lot of the real small trees yet. It hasn't been thinned yet back in there. So, but uh, to give you some advice here, very important advice from someone who knows what he's talking about. Um, <clears throat> why city boy preppers will get you killed with their advice. There are five things that they will recommend which shows that they have no idea what they're doing. All right, this is for when a grid down situation happens, stuff hits the fan, you know, the whole... Oh, end of the world as we know it. Teotwaki, SHTF, you know, the whole thing. And they'll come up with these different pieces of advice. Not very good stuff. Uh, number one, they'll talk about generators. We'll cover these in more detail in a minute. Generators, number two, uh, MREs, military MREs and survival foods. Number three, synthetic clothes. Number four, candles. And number five, bug out bags with cheap survival goods. <laughs> Uh, I always laugh when I see people recommending this stuff because it's all just nonsense. Let me explain, okay? Number one, generators. Um, the grid goes down and what are you going to do? Now there's no electricity. Well, that's okay. I have my generator I got and I've never used before and it's out there with a bunch of, you know, 15 gallons of gas. I'm going to be good for a while, you know. And they go out there and they start this generator up and it's, we have a cabin down this way down the road here sort of toward the uh north the northwest of us and they're city people and um nice people and everything but uh city people and we always talk about oh sounds like jenny's back <laughs> the generator and you know they just run it all the time and uh that's how they power their cabin uh, 
they can hear it even back at our place. And uh, it's irritating, so irritating. I hate to hear generators just running all the time. And then when they go to bed, you hear it shuts down. And um, uh, grid down situation. What are you doing? Well, you're advertising that you have fuel and probably food. Uh, they're loud. You can hear generators from very far away. Well, there's a Honda that is really quiet. Yeah, I know, I have one. And uh, generators, for those of us that are actually real off-gridders, generators are used for powering tools that you can't get in the cordless variety. That's what you use a generator for, okay? You don't use a generator to run your cabin all the time. I mean, there are some guys that do, but they put them in a generator house, which is very well insulated so that you're not hearing the generator. And uh, even that's still a little bit, eh, you know, the uh, real secret to off-grid living is not needing a lot of electricity. <clears throat> and you can watch, I have a whole big, I think it's 10 or 12 parts or something, uh, off-grid seminar. Many hours of research went into that, talking about how to get away from using electricity off-grid. There's a lot of things that you can do. And again, you get some of that when you get into the military, but uh, a lot of the Guys, if you've been raised in a wilderness type of area and you go to deer camp and your deer camp's not on grid, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of things that you can do to get away from electricity use and you just get onto it. It's, it's fine. It's actually kind of neat to get away from uh, the grid for a while. But uh, it's a good way to let people know that you're there and that you have fuel and food. If it's a real bad situation, again, you know, it's a natural disaster, neighbors helping each other, fine. If your generator's out there running, it's annoying, but whatever. But if you have a bad situation where the society is crumbling and there's rioters and looters coming around, your generator is going to let them know uh, that your house is a good one to hit. Something to keep in mind. Um, next point I wanted to make here, I wrote some notes down for this one. Very important. <clears throat> um, what if your Jenny breaks down? Can you fix it? In Montana years ago, I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again for this video. And I was taking a shower at my brother's off-grid cabin, log cabin that he had built himself. And uh, I was in the shower and, and he had a, you know, kind of water tank and then he had a uh, generator that would power, you know, power the water pump, pump water into the water tank and then it would go in and make the shower work. And uh, his generator, the, it ran out of water and so he said, I'll oh, run out and get the generator started. Went out and he was trying to start the generator and he couldn't get the thing started and I'm standing in there, you know, all soaped up and everything. Soap ended up drying on my skin. <laughs> Not much fun. He had to go down to the neighbor and get some water from him. A um, couple gallon jugs of water to come up. I had to pour it over myself. Um, but what if it breaks down? Hmm. That's kind of a problem, isn't it? So, Oh, I have a generator. I don't have anything to worry about. Uh, that's the problem. I even heard the one time that there was a time when there was uh, some things had, you know, some big power outage type of deal. And these people had a generator and they had it running to keep their refrigerator and their chest freezer and whatever else going. And uh, he wakes up in the morning and he still hears his generator outside. At least he thought so. And, uh, but he walks out and his, his refrigerator's off and his freezer's off and the lights aren't working and he thinks... What's going on? Walks outside and there his lawnmower is sitting there running and his generator's gone. Somebody got his lawnmower out, started it up and let it sit there beside the generator, unplugged the generator and took off with it. So a generator is a very quick way to get yourself caught uh, in a bad situation if the grid goes down. But again, you'll see these people, you should have a generator. You should you know, make sure you have plenty of gas for your generator and, and things. And I've seen these guys, you go into these garages and there's a brand new generator sitting there with cans of gas beside it. You need to run it. If you're going to use it, you need to make sure it works. Make sure, you know, test it and whatever. Okay, number two, uh, MREs um, from the military and survival foods. Townhouse and I forget all the other survival buckets, you know, that can last for seven years. Seven years of food, you know, so you can make it through the Great Tribulation. Um... <laughs> Uh, there's a reason it has a long shelf life, okay? Because it's filled with toxic preservatives. And if you start to eat that stuff all the time, where the grid's down, there's no stores open, you, you have to bug out or whatever, um, you're going to be dead, okay? Or so constipated, you'll wish you were dead. All right. Uh, 
that stuff is not good for you, okay? And it's not really truly the ancient system of food preservation, all right? Uh, dried goods is what you actually want to store up on. And some people, of course, they recommend this. That's good, but stay away from the freeze-dried garbage and MREs from the military. That stuff's junk. Um, dried beans, pasta, rice, oatmeal, things like that are good to have. All right, those are the type of things that you can store up. They'll last you many years if you keep them in a dry, you know, cool area. They'll last for a long time. Um, apple cider vinegar, any kind of white vinegar for cleaning things, apple cider vinegar for uh, a lot of health uses and things like that. That will last you for pretty much indefinitely. Raw honey, um, maple syrup, superfood powders, cacao, uh, maca root, um, turmeric, things like that. They're very high nutrient dense. If you can't get regular food, it might be a good idea to have some of those superfood powders. On uh, dried fruit and nuts, another thing. Raisins, cranberries, dried cherries. Um, stay away from stuff that has a lot of the, um, uh, I can't think of what it's called, not dextrose, but uh, there's different chemicals and things that they'll use to actually help preserve the fruit, the dried fruit. And that stuff I'd stay away from. You'll see it on dried pineapples, uh, apricots, uh, things like that, you know. Um, but if you can get just good um, dried cranberries, raisins, uh, cherries and things, those are really good for you. And you can rehydrate them as well. Put them, Soak them in water and they'll rehydrate and make it easier to digest them. And of course, another thing would be nuts. They don't have a huge shelf life, but you know, you can get salted nuts and they'll last for a long time as well. Um, pretty good for uh, a lot of different purposes there. So that's another thing. Um, spices, herbs, and sugar and salt. Another thing that will last for a very long time. Again, you have to keep it dry. Don't put it in a damp area, that will ruin it. And don't get white sugar or white salt. You want to get uh, Celtic sea salt. Um, the uh, it's kind of a it's damp a little bit. It comes from the ocean, and um, but that stuff will last for a long time. A gray sea salt, in other words. Uh, I, I'm not really into the pink Himalayan salt. It stuff gives me headaches, so I don't mess with that. But um, as far as sugar is concerned, you want uh, cane sugar is really good. It's kind of a brown sugar. Um, if you can't get cane sugar, then a good brand of brown sugar is good, but make sure it comes from pure cane sugar sources and not, you know, molasses dyed uh, white sugar, um, which is real. That stuff is there. So that's another thing that you can get. Again, sugar and salt are preservatives, real, true, natural preservatives. You can come out here. There's uh, none right here in the general vicinity around me, but maple trees, you can tap the maple trees, you get the syrup, cook it down, or the sap, cook it down into syrup. If you keep cooking it down, it turns into sugar. Very laborious process, but it is possible. Some people are a lot better at it than I am. We have a few sugar maple trees on the property here, but mostly red maple. Red maple makes a darker syrup and not nearly as high yield as the sugar maple, Acer saccharum, if you want to get into the Latin. Um, <clears throat> you can also get uh, birch trees, also will yield a syrup, but again, the sugar content's really low in the syrup. And you're better off just drinking that, that sap not syrup, the, the sap, excuse me. Um, so yeah, there's the thing is in terms of MREs and survival food, avoid that stuff, it's terrible. I see people, you know, stock up on all these things. I have, you know, five years of food, survival food, garbage, okay. Um, I hiked the Appalachian Trail for a little while with my brothers, my two older brothers back when I was a teenager and we were eating MREs. Oh. Man, talk about, you know, feeling terrible. My brother said, you know, if you eat these crackers and this other thing in the MRE, he said, you won't have to go number two for a while. And so that makes it nicer when you're hiking. Yeah, but after a couple of days of not going to the bathroom, you know, it starts to get a little painful. You start to uh, not enjoy life very much. But uh, number three, synthetic clothing. Okay, I see this again. You know, I have my polar fleece for when it's cold. Uh, I used to be into that stuff myself. Again, I'm not judging, but uh, I'm telling you from experience, years of experience, what you want for cold temperatures. It's about probably in the teens out here right now. Okay, look at what I'm wearing. I'll show you my coat here in a minute, but what is this? A pure wool sweater, knit sweater. 
Uh, if I'm going to be hiking and doing work outside, doing firewood, splitting firewood or whatever, it's going to be a cotton underlayer and a wool outer layer, layer or cotton shirt, uh, cotton flannel, and wool is what I wear. Um, wool long underwear of a real fine micron, it's not scratchy. And then if I'm just going to be standing a lot and talking, then there is nothing better. This is the very highest level that you can get to right here of warmth for winter, uh, cold environments. Shearling. What is shearling? Leather on the outside and the fur of the animal on the inside. There isn't anything better than that. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think the native people in Alaska, they use two layers of shearling. And I think it's fur on the inside, leather on the outside, and then leather on the outside, fur, or leather on the inside, fur on the outside. So it's two layers of, you know, fur to leather, leather to fur to the outside. And uh, just about impervious to any kind of cold. Um, this will block, you know, I ride snowmobile and I have shearling on. I don't bother with the synthetic suits and whatever else and stuff. I don't like to wear plastic, okay? And that's basically, uh, synthetic fibers are derived from the same petroleum that produces plastic and diesel and gas and everything else. Uh, no thank you. Um, there was a reason B-17 uh, crews wore shearling leather suits, pants and tops, because up there, when you're flying up there in World War II and the doors, side doors are open and everything else, it's 30 below zero when you get up high up there. Well, I've been in 30 below zero uh, many times up here in northern Maine, and uh, synthetic clothes just don't do it. And you sweat in synthetic clothing, and the sweat builds up, it has nowhere to go, because it's basically a plastic bag um, that you're wearing. So this is what's best. You say, well, I've checked into it, it's really expensive. Yeah, if you buy it brand new, you know. I bought this coat here um, for about one-tenth of the cost of a brand new one. Got it on eBay. People down south will buy a shearling coat and they want something warm and then they realize how hot it is. Uh, it's not designed for southern environments. And um, and then they end up selling it to people like me. <laughs> so thank you, appreciate that. But again, uh, I've seen people, you know, I wear polyester and things. I have all this polar fleece, all these warm things and whatever for if it gets really cold. I could be out here all day in this clothes, in these clothes. Uh, my hands are a little bit cold right now, but I have gloves for that. Again, I'll show you my gloves if you haven't seen them. This is a little survival thing here. These are were made in Russia. Sellers not there on eBay anymore because uh, Russia is a great evil nation and whatever. And the liberal, the liberal nuts in America, you know, we can't let uh, a seller from Russia be on eBay selling, you know, mittens and gloves because. That could be some kind of an inside job or something, you know, stupid. But there it is. You can see close up. It's goat hair. Knit goat hair. Unreal how warm these gloves are. And I mean, they're, they're somewhat porous. I mean, you can see my skin through those in there, you know, in there. But the, the, they're just so warm. It's incredible. I've never had gloves that warm before. But um, let me get that thing off of there. Uh, natural fibers, cotton, linen, cotton is more for down south, linen's a better fiber for up here, a uh, better base layer, but uh, cotton, linen, wool, uh, silk in some cases, I'm not really much of a silk fan, but uh, there's some cases it's okay, but um, again, very important. The only time I would ever wear any kind of a synthetic thing or plastic type of deal is if it's raining and I have to shed rainwater. But I've been out in the rain with wool on and wool will absorb the rain. It'll get wet, but it still will keep you warm. Pretty amazing stuff. So you learn that over the years when you're you know, truly in a survival type of situation. And um, so yeah, number four, candles for light. Make sure you have lots of candles in case the grid goes down. Uh, candles are okay, but there, there's a lot of problems with candles. For the problem number one is that most candles are actually uh, petroleum based. They're not, the wax is not a natural wax. So basically you are breathing in, it's like sitting inside breathing in exhaust. And um, the one time, uh, summertime here, we have lots of nice insect friends that love to come around and, and uh, they're after your blood 
mosquitoes, black flies, and then sand gnats. Many people call them uh, no see -ums. And these little sand gnats are so small, they can go right through the holes of your window screen and come right in. And we were trying to sleep, and these little sand gnats were coming in real bad the one day, and uh, well, one night, and they were coming in and bother bothering us a lot while we were trying to sleep. So I had a candle at the time, nice scented candle or something, peach scent or something. Again, totally uh, artificial and fake. They don't put real peach juice in the candle. It's just chemicals to make it smell like a peach. But um, we lit the candle and I put it over near the one window and you'd see these little sand nuts would come in and they'd get near the flame, flame and psh, they'd burn up. So I thought, hey, this is good. It's taking care of the problem. I'll just let it burn all night. We had all the windows open and um, by morning we woke up. We each had black nostrils where we were sleeping. Just sleeping like that, breathing in the air, which wasn't even completely smoke filled, but just seeing that, and I thought, oh, you know, there was a book, uh, How to Live Without Electricity and Like It. Uh, I have it in my collection. And she talked about that, that most candles are uh, based on toxic chemicals and you're, be you're breathing that in. I mean, even in the summertime with all the windows open, didn't fill the whole place up with smoke, but even then, we're still breathing that in over an extended period of time, start getting black on your nose. That was it for me. I said, uh, no more candles. And again, you're dealing with a open flame, an open flame that can get knocked over, an open flame that can, that is producing heat. If you're in the summertime and it's a grid down situation, your little candle that you have there is not really the, that good of an idea. And I have in my off grid seminar, the whole thing on lighting. And I talk about the best type of lights that we have found in all of our years of study and research, and that is rechargeable battery LED lights. Milwaukee, DeWalt, there's probably other ones out there that you could use. Uh, we charge them, right now I'm actually charging them with our solar power. There's not a whole lot of sun today, but enough that it can uh, give us enough power to charge the solar batteries, or our, our tool batteries, our Milwaukee ones. Milwaukee uh, M18, um, Cordless lights are the best, in my opinion. The DeWalt makes one as well, but the Milwaukee ones are the best. Uh, again, from all of our years of research on that issue. So, again, do you have those? Most guys I see, city boy preppers, and they'll say, you know, they'll hold up a bunch of little candles, little stubs and big candles, like the tall tapered candles, and they'll say, make sure you have candles for light. I just think, <laughs> you don't get it. You don't get it. You don't understand. Uh, that's not good. All right, and finally, I'll cover the last one here. <clears throat> I'm just trying to get this done quick. Um, if you want to see the whole thing, watch the off-grid seminar. But the bug out bags with cheap survival goods. Oh, brother. Uh, you know, duffel bag, it's a special bag. It has everything you need to survive. Uh, yeah, and uh, usually you'll get some Chinese-made, cheap communist Chinese-made uh, knife survival knife and it has a hollow handle with a compass up on the like the pommel I think you call it up there on the top and it's got a sawtooth you know thing on the top of the above the blade you know and, and you can cut trees down with this thing or something <laughs> you know uh -uh, no um, there are some very good quality knives out there uh, Kershaw makes some good ones um, Buck makes some good ones um, Cold Steel they kind of sold out to China but they had some good ones if you can get an older one um, there's a there's a bunch of them again put anything that you want to add to the, what I'm saying put it in the comments section down below read Comments learn from each other here. That's the point of this channel But uh, watch out for these cheap knives and these survival Kit things and you know you get the tube tent You know, it's, it's a plastic tube and you can sleep in it. No, oh, it's shelter in case the, the world comes to an end uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, you can do it, yeah. Yeah, it's better than just laying out in the rain. I get it, but uh, there's other options out there that are better. Uh, space blanket. Again, I see that, space blanket. And I've known guys, you know, that uh, <clears throat> guys that are ex-military and whatever else, and they say, yeah, tried space blankets. You know, one uh, different training exercise we were on, and they had us wrap up in space blankets or whatever, lay on the ground and see how it works, and it didn't work too good. And, Knew a guy, it was snowing, and he said he went out, wrapped up all in space blankets, and, and wanted to see how long he could last 
throughout the night it didn't last very long <laughs> and uh you know space blankets i'm not a fan of that it's just plastic with a shiny glossy side on it or something um uh, there's probably some use to them you know make a rainwater catchment thing or something or you know try to shield yourself from FLIR cameras or whatever but uh that's about it so uh and then of course you know one other thing i want to mention is the part of your bug out situation make sure your cell phone's ready to go and well again you know okay i get it there is some tactical advantage to having a cell phone you know you want to contact people or whatever else but uh if you're coming out here, chances are your cell phone's not going to be working very good. Um, I mean, there's areas we go to regularly to hike and fish and whatever else, and GPS doesn't even work back there. So uh, cell phones definitely do not work back there. The Allagash Wilderness, which is that way to the west of my property here, um, cell phones aren't even allowed back in there, I don't think. If you get way back into the far back regions and if you snuck one in it wouldn't matter because it wouldn't work uh, yes there are places you can get to where cell phones do not work and those are the places where you're going to be safe because quite frankly I've I've learned one thing about goonies uh, bad guys and whatever and that is most of them nowadays are lazy um, so but that should cover it and they won't go walking back in places and whatever but that should cover it I see my battery's about dead here so hopefully you've learned something Watch the off-grid uh, survival thing here, the uh, off-grid seminar, and uh, put your comments down below. I'd like to read them. Thank you for watching.